PPC-157. And the PPC oh, piping. BPC 157. I don't know what this thing yeah, is. Yeah, it's a peptide. Yeah. They, they're doing that with BPC-157. All right, a word on BPC-157. We've previously discussed the war on peptides, how financial incentive, i.e. big pharma money, has led to the propulsion of the Novo Nordisk stock, yet at the same time has led the FDA this past fall to place a big red warning against compounding of some of the very interesting peptides that have tried to creep into the mainstream. Peptides like BPC-157, CJC-1295, ipamorolin, ibutamarin, a non-peptide agonist of the ghrelin growth hormone hormone secretagogue receptor, and many others. Today, let's dive into the history of gastric peptide BPC-157, a favorite of the peptide community, and compare it to the rapid uptick of the GLP-1s like semaglutide. Why is one only talked about amongst those interested in peptides while the other has become interwoven into the very fibers of today's society? And even though the easy answer is money, I think it's worth a deeper dive. To my returning subscribers, I'm beyond grateful for you all. For those of you who have yet to subscribe, here's your chance to for further peptide content. Thank you in advance. BPC-157 stands for Body Protection Compound 157. It's named for its observed ability to promote diffuse healing and for its shape as a pentadecapeptide made of 15 amino acids. It was isolated in the early 1990s and has since been the subject of predominantly rodent research. However, has shown an ability to heal numerous types of wounds and fistulas. Investigated for more local gastrointestinal repair and more diffusely, for injury to muscle and tendon. It's the most popular subject discussed on this channel and many popular figures involved in popularizing optimization data like Dr. Andrew Huberman, Dr. Peter Atia, and Derek from More Plates More Dates have been talking about it too. Then there's also something called BPC-157, which is actually on based on a gastric peptide. It turns out that there's a gastric peptide that we all make that can promote healing of tissues. And I've talked to Joe a lot about this. There's not a lot of data on this, whereas there are a lot of data on sermorelin, but BPC, like I had an L5 compression and I was always like in pain standing up from a, a dumb thing. I don't deadlift anymore. I just made a dumb mistake um, in terms of form. And massage, heat there, electric therapy, the whole thing, two injections of BPC-157. Look, if it was placebo, okay, I'll take it, gone. Mm. Gone. BB, and the BBC 157 is remarkable. A few years ago, a guy um, tore his Achilles right before the Olympics, came back. BBC 157 was implicated in that. So again, you want to get good, clean sources. There are physicians that will prescribe these. Again, these aren't going to shut down fertility or testosterone production. Um, Could and then make there's my kids wonky or anything like that? If not I that it. we are aware of. <laughs> Now, the first GLP-1 agonist founded was called exenatide, and it was approved by the FDA in 2005 for management of type 2 diabetes. Semaglutide would not be developed until seven years later, and just recently, it had taken the world by storm. Oh! 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 oh. People with type 2 diabetes are excited about the potential of once-weekly Ozempic. In a study with Ozempic, a majority of adults lowered their blood sugar and reached an A1C of less than 7 and maintained it. Oh, under 7. And you may lose weight. In the same one-year study, adults lost on average up to 12 pounds. Oh! It's been branded into three different products, Ozempic, Wegovi, and Rebelsis, each of which has its own FDA approval. And as a result, the Novo Nordisk stock has elevated itself to new heights. Heights. And there's more on the way. Terzepatide, branded as Munjaro and Zepbound, added agonism of glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide, which we've discussed and will be in the link below. And Ritatratide is on the horizon as it additionally stimulates glucagon receptors. Also, full video, deep dive in the description below. Yes, like everybody, I've been wrong before, but I anticipate by 2025, Ritatratide, or Reta, will be a household name with its own catchy jingle. And I'm sure that tornado of GLP-1 agonism production is just beginning. And since we have these huge pharmaceutical companies developing these products, Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk, we have these big research projects that involve a lot of participants crafted by these organizations. And even though there certainly exists conflict of interests, we get the clinical data that we need. For instance, let's just type in semaglutide and EGM for New England Journal of Medicine.
one, and we really see a lot of the data that we're hoping to see. Semaglutide use in all realms from adolescents to adults suffering from obesity and complications of type 2 diabetes, with an extensive number of citations, and really big clinical trials. So now we find ourselves at a catch-22, right? Because what we need is a heavily financed pharmaceutical company to take over development of BPC-157. And there's certainly indicated use as so many people not only suffer from gastrointestinal damage, whether it be from inflammatory bowel diseases or peptic ulcer disease or a myriad of other conditions, not to mention the huge market that exists for people with musculoskeletal injuries, whether they be acute or chronic damages of old age. However, the FDA just shunned production of BPC-157 for lack of clinical data indicating its safety, when in actuality what we need is this clinical data to determine its safety, hence the frustration of many people. BPC-157 has been clinically evaluated by a company called Pharmacotherapia under the name Bipesin, and a study to take place in Tijuana, Mexico was crafted in 2015 to evaluate its pharmacokinetics and safety profile, and it was unfortunately freaking cancelled. If any of my viewers just happens to be a big pharma employee who is concealing his or her interest in addressing the unknowns about BPC-157 in human studies from acute adverse effects to longer-term impact on angio genesis via VEGF expression and gastrointestinal absorption, I think going through the rodent-derived data is a good place to start. We've talked about BPC-157 countless times and walked through most of the studies on this channel, dare I say more so than any other channel, which will of course be linked below. We've done our best to calculate and optimize dosing regimen and assess the risks as we know, but in my honest opinion, pharmaceutical data is what's needed to propel the production of this limitlessly fascinating peptide. Thanks for watching, as always I'm curious to hear your thoughts. If you like this video and want to see more like it, give us a like and subscribe. It's the only way to support a small peptide YouTuber like myself. If you hated it, drop a dislike. Regardless, thank you for the time to watch this and I hope you have a great day.